longtime writer and columnist at the Buffalo News, Mike Heritage, joins me to talk Sabres and plenty more coming up right now here on Talking Buffalo. Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. I am your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you very much, as always, for locking in, for watching, for listening, for following, for subscribing. Appreciate y'all very much. I'm joined right now by my good old friend here, Mike Carrington from the Buffalo News. What's going on, Mike? How you doing? Pat, thanks for having me as always. Yeah, there's, there's really not a lot going on with the Sabres right now. I don't know what we're going to talk about. There's just not much really to say. <laughs> I really don't want to talk about them, but we're going to, of course. Uh, I got to say this too, dude. It is so, what is it, March here? We're taping this anyway, March 5th. Beautiful right. weather outside, man. This is just picture perfect. Uh, it's not even spring yet, but a it, it's a spring-like Western New York day here. You're going to be going to the uh, arena in a little bit here on a on a Tuesday, kind of wish you could cover practice from outside. <laughs> yeah. Have an, have an outdoor game, you know, let them practice at Delaware park and, uh, <laughs> you know, let them uh, play somewhere out in orchard park. But yeah, we're still, you know, you're in full hockey mode, even when it's 70 degrees in March. And the thing is, Pat too, is remember you do this when you travel to places like Florida and California and Dallas, it is a little jarring at times when you get warm weather covering this team. Yeah, for sure. I need to also preface one thing, too, because we are a couple days from the NHL trade deadline as we record this, and we're recording this relatively early here on Tuesday morning. So if by some chance any crazy <laughs> shit goes down, if there's a big trade or something like that or anything involving the Buffalo Sabres, just know that we have already taken this show um, ahead of time. We'll, we'll get into the Sabres here specifically. I, I kind of want to ask you, man, just talk about the job a little bit like this year specifically you know does covering a team let me ask you this does covering a team that is going to be going on 13 years now without making the playoffs does it harden you a little bit to everything like let me give you an example if i was on the dating scene if i was i'm not a single guy but if i were and i were on the dating scene and just time after time you meet someone and there's just there's promise there you go on a couple dates and things are going well for whatever reason it just never seems to work out at some point i kind of feel like i start to feel dead inside <laughs> when you cover this team do you kind of feel that way a little bit at all no you really can't pat the job mm -hmm. is the job and i tell people all the time if they stink and have the number one overall pick i'm there and i'm covering them if they win the stanley cup i'm there and i'm covering them too Sure. You, you know, it's an 82 game season. I always joke my goal is to be 82 and 0. And that means to write a good story, to make deadlines, whatever. And some days you fail, just like some days the players fail. But uh, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not wedded to wins and losses. I'm wedded to telling the story, no matter what it is. And it is a bizarre story because you would think, what? You could luck into a playoff berth one time in 13 years, right? But in terms of the, not making the playoffs, the business would be helped if they were in the playoffs. The fans would be in a better mood. The readers would be in a better mood. But it can't change my mood at all. All right. So I get that. Like, your mood has to remain consistent no matter what. Your job is the job, like you say. And you're right. From a fan perspective, I'm I'm sure you can relate to it. You know, how, how fans feel right now with this team. You go to last year, and, God, they were so close. And even forget the record. Throw last season's record out the window. They were fun to watch. It was an entertaining brand of hockey. And then you fast forward to this year. It's not the same. They're, what, 62 games in? And they're literally 29, 29, and four right now as, as we record this. They're at an 82-point pace. They're nine points right. off of last year, 10 right. points out of the playoffs. Just, uh, I, I, I guess I'm asking you, even though it's not part of your job to relate to fans, I'm sure that you do relate to the fans and the frustration which boils over on like apps like, say, social media and stuff like that. You see it a lot. Sometimes you have fun with it. Sometimes people cross the line and, you know, really piss you off or whatever. But I'm sure to some level, at least, I'm, I'm sure you can relate to fans right now. Sure. I, I mean, 13 years out of the playoffs, it almost feels like they're not in the league. Look at 
in these 13 years, how many playoff games have the Tampa Bay Lightning played? How many playoff games have the Pittsburgh Penguins, or now that they stink, even the Chicago Blackhawks, how many playoff games have they played in these 13 years? Some of these teams and some of these reporters have covered 100 playoff games in that span. The Sabres have played zero. So I understand fan frustration here. People spend a lot of money on season tickets to get the playoff tickets. And there have been no playoff tickets, so I get all of that. Um, it, it's a hard problem because there's no way this league wants this market out of the playoffs for this long, and they just haven't been able to figure it out. You have been covering the team and the sport for a long time. So even if you take the 13 years out of the equation, you know what it's like to write about a team that's actually good. There's some... There's a decent yeah. amount of journalists out there that have not been doing this for all that long, and they probably don't even know what it's like right now to cover a team like, say, the Sabres were in the mid-2000s, you know, a really exciting team that rejuvenated this town, and the enthusiasm was uh, was so good. I, I think about that a lot. Somebody like Lance, your colleague at the Buffalo News, great writer, by the way, a big fan of Lance. He hasn't been around long enough. You don't know what it's like to cover a team, you know, <laughs> no. that is that is actually good. Kind of like, and I'm sure fans feel this way too, even like for the media, when you hear, like when you go into the locker room, like you said, job aside, just the the mindset when, when a team is losing year after year, or even over to just say, forget about 13 years, just over the last couple of years, isn't it hard, is it harder to do your job when, it, when a team struggles like the Sabres seem to do every single year, like the players, the moods, the vibe? what they want to tell you, what they don't want to tell you when they're losing. Does that make the job harder for you to do? I mean, last year was easier because they were on an upward plane. They were getting close. You know, they struggled in March. They had a run at the end, so they were in the playoff race legitimately till game 80 last year. This year, I think there was a lot of shock value. They thought they had arrived. The GM thought they had arrived. The coach thought they had arrived. They thought they were going to go from 75 points to 91, and now from 91 to, say, 102, and make the playoffs. So there was a lot of shock early in the year when things weren't going well. And now I think reality has kind of set in here, and I think guys are just waiting for the trade deadline to see what happens, see who comes, see who goes. But, yeah, I, did, I think these guys all thought they were a playoff team this year. And let's be honest, Pat, most of North America picked them to make the playoffs. Yeah. This was not – you know, a team that people said, well, if this goes right or that goes right, most people pick them essentially to be in the spot that Detroit is in right now. So there's a lot of shock value here, and they need to reevaluate everything in this organization going forward. Kevin Adams talked to Lance over this past weekend. Uh, I, was in, I was in the room for the same conversation. All right, so he says, and I'm using a direct quote here. I want to make sure I don't screw it up. He goes, we are a 500 team right now, period. That's fact. Now let's take the emotion out and find out why. Let me ask you, instead of asking Kevin Adams a follow-up there, in your opinion, why? Why are the Sabres a 500 team right now? Well, he didn't do enough in, in the rearview mirror in the offseason. Uh, I do think that you needed another forward when Jack Quinn got hurt. You know, Adams' explanation I get. He said, we knew he wasn't going to be out the whole season. He was going to be out 25, 30 games. Thompson got hurt in November, and I think they thought, Pat, they could just tread water and get to Christmas and still be in the race, and they just got too far out of it. On the ice, what really hurt them? Injuries hurt them, but everybody has injuries, but they did have a significant injury to all three guys on their top line. The biggest factor to me really is the power play. This team is as good at five on five as it was last year. It's better in net than it was last year. It's better defensively than it was last year. Penalty kill, certainly since January 1st, better than it was last year. What's the difference? They didn't score enough on the power play. Their top goal scorers didn't produce. That's the big problem with this club right now. And it, it cost them games over and over and over again, losing on special teams. And they didn't figure it out. Granado finally pulled back, took more control of the power play. The power play has been a lot better the last eight to ten games. Hmm. What's happened the last eight to 10 games? They've won a lot. It's really not a coincidence. Are you shocked at all by how inconsistent, I'll say inconsistent, I'm being kind. You could say how bad this team has played often at home this year 
and last year. Last year, they missed the playoffs by just two points. They're three games right. under 500. If they're mm-hmm. even a 500 team at home last year, they're in the playoffs. This year, they're under 500 again at home. Like, why? Are, I, I know there's not one singular reason, but like, in your estimation, why does this team play better on the road than they do at home? And obviously, a kind of a rhetorical question, I guess, but how much is the fact that they're not playing well at home factor into them being on the outside looking in yet again? Sure. I, I mean, last year they had 25 road wins. They have the most road wins of any team that didn't make the playoffs in the NHL since 2016. That's how <sighs> significant, how good they played on the road last year and how tough the home situation is. And you know, Pat, it's two years in a row. If we had an answer for it, they'd figure it out. But people have to understand that I'm very lucky in the job I'm in. Mean, I travel a lot. I go to a lot of these other rinks. We have a terrible atmosphere in our rink. Our rink is mostly dead. And that's not the fans' fault. That's the fault of the organization. The right. organization has sucked the life out of our building most of the time. The game presentation has been up and down over the years. But the fans are dead. The fans are dead inside because of losing. You know, they are in show-me mode. And, and you know, we've seen it. That game last week against Vegas, if you give them something to cheer about, that building was alive. They, are, they were boat racing the Stanley Cup champions. They were all over them. The place was alive. It's not alive as much. Now, you know, I could do some different tweaks to that building. You know, more party areas would take, you know, construction. I could do different game presentation. I would be playing less matinees for one thing, Pat. Matinees aren't great for hockey players. They're not great for atmosphere. You shouldn't be playing a quarter of your games in the afternoon. I know you're trying to build your fan base and attract kids and whatever. And I get all that. That's not done in other cities. I would stop playing 10 matinees a year for one thing. That's the first thing I would do. Um, But again, if you don't score in the first period, you don't get your building going, you don't get an early lead, the place is dead. And I don't know what the answer is. It's never going to change. The fans now are in prove-it mode. Until you make the playoffs, they're never going to be 100% behind this team. And I get it. There's a school of thought that a lot of, you know, this being a young team, a lot of the the young players just, I'm not saying necessarily they prefer to play on the road, but they do play better on the road, maybe because there's less distractions in yeah. personal life, you know, away from the rink. They're all, we're all human beings, including players who play in the NHL, you know, and they got families, they got babies, they got, they got wives and, and other things like that. And when you're a young team, I mean, there's lots of young teams in the league too. The Sabres aren't the only young team in the league. But do you think that factors in a little bit that maybe they're just a little more locked in, less distractions, and more focused when they're on the road, and they thrive better just in louder buildings when they're on the road? They're way more focused. They're together as a team. And, and Pat, again, some of these atmospheres in these road buildings are just wild. And they seem to thrive on it. They seem to thrive on the noise in a place like Philly, in a place like Winnipeg, Boston, Madison Square Garden. You know, they've won two years in a row now in in Vegas. They seem to thrive in that. And it's maybe a young characteristic. They don't like the booing. You know, well, you get booed. I mean, it happens. It's professional sports. Um, yeah, I think, you know, young families, there's a lot of factors here. There is no one factor why the Buffalo Sabres have stunk too much at home in the last two years. There are a lot of factors and in the last three or four minutes here, we've gone over a bunch of them. <laughs> and the players certainly are a factor. And to some extent, the head coach has to be as well. During this um, conversation with Kevin Adams, that you were there for, I want to make sure I have this right, but Kevin Adams said that he would he wants Don Granado back next year. He did say that, it's, correct? It's, it's widely known, you know, that Granado has a contract extension that hasn't started yet. Right. Now, L.A. fired Todd McClellan with a contract extension that hasn't started yet. Um, what happened on Monday? New Jersey fired Lindy Ruff with a contract extension that hasn't started yet. I don't expect Terry Pagula to pay Don Granado not to coach. Um, having said that, I think it would behoove Don Granado to continue to win hockey games here the next six weeks of the season. He's not going anywhere if they keep playing the way they're playing since January 1st. You're not firing a coach who's team is on a 95 point pace um but they need to start the season better next year they need to attack training camp differently and 
Don Granado is going to be on a short leash come next year. There's going to be no more patience with him, no more waiting for him, because this is a league that doesn't care about coaches. Players run this league. These teams think coaches are disposable. That's how they act toward them. And uh, Granado's going to have to be on a short leash. All right, so I was going. Well, I was going to ask you if you think Granado should be on a short leash. You pretty much already just answered that for me right now. Did you know? I mean, obviously you knew. I didn't know. I had to look this shit up, Mike. When I have you on the show, when I talk to you, I got to make sure I do some homework here and have some numbers in front of me. So a, I don't look like an idiot, and b, you don't call me out rightfully so for sounding like an idiot. But I did not know he's actually the sixth longest tenured hey. coach right now in the NHL. Doesn't feel like it, but he. God, it's this is stupid. a crazy league. This is a crazy, crazy league. Four of the six, I looked it up, too, before we started taping here. Four of the six above him and won a cup. So, I mean, you know, you, you win a cup or you don't stick around as long as Don Granado has been around with the Sabres, it, it appears. You know, John Tortorello was in Toronto before a Flyers game a few weeks ago talking about this, how it's ridiculous how coaches are not respected anymore. These teams just think they can cycle through get the next guy. And you look at it now, you can run a list of five or six names out there of guys who are available. You can add Lindy Ruff to the list and Craig Berube and Gerard Gallant and Bruce Boudreaux. There's retreads all over the place. And these teams just cycle through these guys and they don't care. Um, so Granado really is in a fortunate place here. I don't think Terry Pagula is going to pay him not to coach. I think Adams clearly wants him to be the coach. He hasn't lost the dressing room at all. You can tell by the way they play. I mean, you know, the New Jersey Devils were terrible. They Lindy had kind of lost them. The Devils were frustrated, I think, by the fact the GM didn't get a goalie. Tom Fitzgerald is as, you know, responsible for that problem as Lindy Ruff was. But, you know, we haven't seen the Sabres really put out a lot of any dog games in a while. Since, what's the last dog game? Anaheim, maybe? That's over a month ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, just... I don't count the Anaheim home game as a dog game when you – out, out shoot the team, out attempt the team 70 to 29 and just don't score. Sometimes that's hockey. The game in Anaheim was terrible in January. But, you know, Granado's just got to keep winning. They can't fall apart here. That's all. I want to preface this question by saying it does not apply to you. I want to be really clear about this before I even ask you. And, I, and you know, in the interest of, of full disclosure, I have talked to you about this privately before. All right. So, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. Don Granado, all right, and plus now the team's playing well recently, okay? So this is not maybe the right time to ask this question. But a handful of weeks ago, a month or so ago, when I asked you this type of question, do you think to some extent Don Granado and the Sabres being so mediocre flies a little bit under the radar? They get away with it more in a market like Buffalo because I feel, and this is absolutely not towards any one specific person, it's kind of like generally speaking, and not you. I want to be real clear about that again, but I feel that there's some media, at least anyway, that's kind of go soft on this team. You know, 13 years without making the playoffs, being hugely disappointed again this season after the promise of last season. And time after time, I read at least some tweets or some blurbs, even a couple of posts here and there, whether it's mainstream, whether it's alternative media, you know, oh, golly gee, the Sabres lost again, but, you know, they played pretty well. They should have won, blah, 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 blah. It's like, where's the hammer? You dropped the hammer. I'm a, again, I'm going to give you some props for that. I've always done that. But I just feel like overall, this market or this media that covers this team goes a little too soft at times on this hockey team right now. My take. Well, I, I think there was a feeling. I mean, my feeling is if you were going to fire him, you had to fire him in November, you know, or maybe December if you wanted to save the season. Sure. I, I think there's an element of, when you're covering the Sabres, there is not the veteran group of people in general covering the Sabres that used to cover the Sabres. There isn't the, you know, Adam Benini type around the Sabres, really at, from the television side asking hard questions. There's really no one on the road except for us and Paul. Um, the numbers, the sheer numbers of media are less than it was. Uh, we don't have the numbers coming from Canada. There was a lot of Southern Ontario media used to cover the Sabres or come regularly. Uh, you know, that number has dwindled dramatically. And frankly, they spend most of their time now covering the Leafs. They used to come here because the Sabres were good and interesting and the Leafs were terrible. So you don't see those people nearly as much anymore. So there's a lot of factors 
in the media market. Um, they spend all their time covering the Bills. The Sabres really can fly under the radar until about January. There's not many people around them. Um, I've gone on road trips this season where I've literally been the only independent media person in the locker room. Wow. The only one for an NHL team. You know, the only other people in the locker room are the team reporters. So um, it is an unusual time in media. I do think they fly under the radar a lot in this market during football season. Um, and I do think there was a certain expectation this year, even if they started the year slowly, well, they're going to fix it. They're good. We know they're good. They're in a little slide. They'll fix it. And it just never happened early enough for them to get back in the race. And all of a sudden you're looking up and it's December. You're like, what's going on here? You know, and they didn't have a coaching change on their radar. Who were they going to name as the coach, Pat? They hadn't even thought of it. They weren't going to promote Seth Appert in December. Um, so there was a lot going on in terms of, I just think everything was too laissez-faire. They thought they had arrived and they didn't arrive and they didn't really know what to do at that point. And that, that was a real problem. All right. I'm going to take a real quick break. Plenty more coming back right after the break with uh, Mike Harrington from the Buffalo news. All right. I am back with Mike Harrington from the Buffalo news. I got to ask you this too. Do you, the momentum it seems in terms of players, maybe wanting to start to come to Buffalo. Um, how much does this season kind of put a black eye on that? You know, veterans, yeah. good veterans, potential good veterans might want to come to Buffalo. I saw again, reading the Buffalo news, Lance had um, a blurb in his report that, that said that this, after the Sabres could not lay in Pat Kane, they tried to sign him. He went to Detroit. Um, that they Kevin Adams was trying to trade for a couple of players, but these guys had no trades and none of them wanted to come here. So you look at a season like this, how much does it set them back? Not just in the standings, but also in terms of, you know, a guy that normally maybe Kevin Adams would be able to trade for something like that with a no trade that doesn't want to come here right now. Sure. And you look at what happened in the off season. Eric Johnson and Connor Clifton came in free agency. They yeah. chose to be here. They had talked to other players. You know, Clifton had seen with his own eyes in Boston. Eric Johnson was very close with Kyle Ocbozo. They chose to be here. People aren't going to choose, choose to be here again. The drought has continued. And like you said, now you're at the trade deadline, and people say, trade for this guy, trade for that guy. It's not that easy. Tremendous number of no trade clauses in the NHL now. Too many, in my opinion. And guys are going to have Buffalo on their list. I'm not going there. Adams already told us there were a bunch of guys he tried. I, we believe one of them was Chris Tanev, the defenseman of Calgary, who played a year at RIT. He wasn't coming to Buffalo. He went to Dallas because he can win a Stanley Cup in Dallas. What's he going to do here? Um, I think one of their plans, absolutely, going into the season, especially with Quinn out, was they were going to sign Patrick Kane. And they... We're on a Zoom with Patrick Kane less than a week before he signed. They were right to the end. Where did Patrick Kane go? Now, that's a little bit different. One of the reasons he went, a big reason he went, was Alex DeBrinkett plays for the Red Wings. And that's a guy he was tight with from Chicago. But if the Red Wings were in the hole in the Atlantic Division and the Sabres were flying like we thought they could be, probably Patrick Kane thinks longer about dealing with all the sideshow of Buffalo and coming here. Now they're back, like you said. Who's coming here? Who's coming here on a no-trade clause waving it for Buffalo? Who's coming here this summer in free agency? Kevin Adams is in a rough spot. He's going to have to make trades for guys who have no trade protection, but that's dicey. We saw what happened with Colin Miller. When they acquired him from Vegas, he did his first media phone conference. It was like somebody had stolen his dog. You know, oh. I, I got traded from Vegas to Buffalo, really? You know, I mean... They have a problem now in recruiting again, and we thought that was over. I'd be remiss. You mentioned him earlier. I'd be remiss if I didn't at least ask you. I would get a lot of shit from people who watch the show if I didn't at least ask you about Lindy Ruff. I know you're gonna. I know what you're gonna say. But I'm gonna ask you anyway. Is there any chance that Terry Bagula would consider? You know, maybe after the season, if let's just say sure. the Sabers are playing bad and they finish bad, and Don Granado does get fired, which could be possible if they struggle really bad down the stretch. At least possible. Was would, Do you think it might be feasible for somebody like Wendy Roth to return to Buffalo? Sure. 
I mean, Hitchcock returned places. Uh, Todd Julian's done it. Lindy wanted the job in, in 2019 when Botterill hired Kruger. Botterill didn't give him a sniff of the job. Lindy was interested then after he got fired in Dallas. I think Lindy would be interested now. Um, are they going to do it? You know, first of all, again, Terry Pagula is tired of paying people not to work. Granado has a contract extension. Terry Pagula, people say, well, he's rich, this and that. He's done it before. He's paid a lot of people not to work. He hasn't been building a football stadium before, Pat. He hasn't right. been watching his money more because he's building a football stadium and everything it overruns is out of his pocket. That's a factor that other NHL owners don't have right now. Um, if he fires Granado, who knows who he's going to hire? I mean, Ruff would be a candidate. I mean, if Carolina can't figure it out, Rod Brindamore, doesn't he become a candidate? Didn't Kevin Adams play on Rod Brindamore's team? You know, there, there's guys out there, but again, who wants to come coach the Buffalo Sabres and deal with this drought? Some guys might say, I'm going there. I'll be the hero to solve it. And some guys like, I don't want to deal with all that excess garbage. So, yeah, I think Ruff's a candidate. But, again, I think the plan here is for Granado to come back. But for a team that's going nowhere, as we sit here on March 5th, the games from March 5th to April 15th are going to be important. They may be more important probably for the coach than any individual player. All right, so, Mike, there's young people who might be watching or listening to this podcast today who probably weren't even watching the Sabres. Maybe they weren't even old enough to follow the Sabres back when Lindy Ruff was the coach before. So they might not know the old fun story between Mike Harrington and Lindy Ruff that you coached. Oh, no. So I kind of <laughs> want you, for the young people who wouldn't know, because we're, we're just talking about Lindy Ruff, got to tell them that story, how, how things went down with you and Lindy that day. Uh, it was a nationally televised game on NBC in Chicago, okay? And the Sabres were playing poorly, and they were making mistakes. And I'm trying to remember what happened. It was a, a bad pass by Billy Leno, and Lindy didn't sit the guy out. He didn't sit any shifts out. It turned into a breakaway goal. It got beat 6-2. to two. And so after the game... You know, we talked to him and I simply said to him, you know, why would you not sit a guy out for making a veteran player for making that kind of mistake? And he said, well, we had guys out. We had guys sick. You know, I said, but no, no shifts, didn't miss anything. He puts the puck up the middle, you know, and, and Pierre Maguire was calling the game that night, was just killing the Sabres. Um, I said, how can he not do that? He said, and he gave another answer. And then, okay, granted, a third time I went back to it again. And he said, that's it. And he walks away and he leaves where we're talking to him, starts with going toward the office to the door. So I click my tape recorder off. Paul Hamilton clicks his tape recorder off. So it's lost to the ethers. It's There's no recording of it. He turns around. He looks at me. He said, Mike, you coach. <laughs> and he goes in the office and slams the door. So the next day, the Sabres are in Winnipeg. We go to Winnipeg, and I forever regret I should have gone to a sporting goods store and bought a whistle and shown up at the at the pregame or the next day because we go in the next day, and he's got this big grin on his face. And I finally look at him, and I said to him, what? He's like laughing. I'm like, what? He said, are we still fighting or are we, are we friends? I said, we're always friends. We just disagree. I said, you should have sat him out a shift. You know, so we're fine. I'm a big, I'm a big Lindy Ruff supporter. He should have been fired when he was fired. His shelf life had expired in Buffalo. Um, it was no knock on the fact he had coached 17 years and all he had accomplished. They want to hire him back. Go ahead. You know, I mean, I don't think it's going to happen. I still think Adams is committed to Granado, but yeah, if, if they fire Granado on, you know, Thursday, April 10th at 10 a.m., you know, my first thought is going to be they're going to hire Ruff. May not happen, but yeah. I and, I and again, here's the only thing, Pat. What are they selling next season? They've always had something to sell. They've had a player, the number one pick, Eichel, Darlene, Owen Power. Now this year they're going to make the playoffs. What in the world are you selling next year? You're not going to get any great new players. You're, you're, most of your core is signed long-term. 
I don't know. There could be some marketing concerns there. You might be able to put Lindy Ruff on a few posters and get people to buy some tickets. I mean, I, I, I'm just talking out loud here at this point. I, I was going to say that if from a marketing or selling standpoint, you're asking how are they going to sell this team? I think whether it's Lindy Ruff or whether it's somebody else, a new coach. A new coach is going to be the guy who's going to get this team over to Hoff. He's going to get this team to be more consistent at home. He's going to get the power play to play better from game one instead of, you know, late in the season. You know, we've mentioned Terry Bagula a couple times throughout this episode here. How frustrating is it as from a professional standpoint to, to have an owner who, who rarely, like literally rarely ever speaks about anything about the team? And is it like that? See, you would know this and I wouldn't. Because you you know you follow the league as well. Is it like that in other markets with other owners on other teams no. that they rarely ever speak? Terry Pagula hasn't spoken to the media about the Sabers since the day they fired Botterill in 2020. Now, as oh. I look here, we're at May of 2024. Terry Pagula is going almost on four years without speaking to the media about the Buffalo Sabers. That's crazy. you know that's that's how he chooses to run his business. It's, and I say to people all the time, oh, you should have a president of hockey, this and that. Yeah, he probably should. It's his team. He can do what he wants. You know, I can disagree. Um, at some point, it'd be nice for Terry Pagula to just sit in front of the microphones and say, I'm upset. I understand the fans are upset and answer some questions. He's not going to do it, Pat. He's just not. You know, um, I don't think he wants to take any questions on the stadium and public money and all this other stuff. And because he owns the Bills, he's gonna always going to have football questions. If he talks to the NFL owners meetings like he did a couple years ago, he's going to get hammered with hockey questions. And he just chooses not to do it. And I can jump up and down like a four-year-old and hold my breath if I want. He's not doing it. Now, I haven't even seen him this year. You know, he's at every Bills game. We see him on TV. We see him in the clips in the locker room. You know, Kevin talks to him regularly. I, I haven't seen Terry Pagula at a Sabres game this year. It's not to say he hasn't been at one. I haven't seen him at one. Um, does he care about the Sabres? Absolutely. They're costing him a lot of money. So he cares about what's going on with the Sabres. Believe me, they're losing a lot of money. Um, but that would be a story if he wasn't an NFL owner. But he makes so much money owning an NFL team that, you know, losing his $30 million or whatever it is on the Sabres isn't a big deal. But, yeah. You know, I wish the owner was more accountable. He's not. What am I going to do? Isn't it a fair perception, though, that there's a lot of Sabre fans out there that aren't Sabres and Bills fans. They're Sabre guys or Sabre girls more than mm -hmm. football. Some of them don't even care about football, the football side of things. They're just hockey people. Isn't it fair for them to, to conclude, whether it's right or wrong, that the owner doesn't just, he don't care about this team. He's always, you said it. You always see him at a Bills game. You always see him in the locker room clips. You, you know, he does on occasion speak of the Bills. Never, you know, ghost town when it comes to the Sabres. If you're a hardcore Sabres fan, isn't it fair to conclude that, hey, we got an owner that doesn't give a shit about, our, about us, about this team? Uh, that's a conclusion that's a logical one to take. I don't agree with it. Sure. But, but it's the per sometimes, Pat, as you know, the perception is more important than the reality. That's not the reality. That can be construed as the perception. Um, that's why I wish he was a little more visible. That's why he wish he would, you know, give his angry owner speech to the media once in a while. Um, it's a strange, it's always been strange around the Sabres since he bought the team 13 years ago. And it's going to continue to be strange. And, you know, again, <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to talk to him all the time what am, what am I supposed to do if the man doesn't talk to us what are we supposed to do I've known you long enough to know that you rarely kind of get like dumbfounded and it feels like you're a little bit dumbfounded I'm just why the owner won't talk at all right. through I these know. years it's like puzzling to you I, I can and just you tell remember the, the famous press conference with Darcy Regeer and Ted Black where I lost my mind Yeah, I mean <laughs> that was 11 years ago Pat that wasn't last week. That was 11 years ago I was having that nutty about why won't the owner speak, and Ted Black is saying I represent him and he's available, and I'm like, he's never available, and don't sit there and lie to me. That was 11 <laughs> years ago, and we're still wow. having this conversation. Wow, yeah. 
Well, you know, one more Sabres thing here. With so much negative stuff, and it's hard to have a conversation with somebody who covers a team and not turn it into a negative conversation about the team because of where they are. But if you would have told me before the season started, the strength of the Sabres this year would be goaltending, I would have been, <laughs> like, been like, all right, cool, man. Devin Levi's really stepped up. We saw yeah. a nice sample size at the end of last season. I'm like, God, they got, they got their next Ryan Miller. They got their next young star. He's here. He's arrived. But right. it's UPL. UPL has played really well. I re, I'm old enough to remember, because I said it myself during the preseason, uninformed, that I hated the Sabres keeping three goalies. I'm like, put UPL on waivers. If somebody picks him up, whatever. Not that big of a deal. Man, where he would be right now, we're not for UPL. I, I guess what I want to ask you is, do you think the way he's playing right now, is this a, is this a nice story for, for this season? Or... Is this a guy that you think, um, you know, Kevin Adams should have a lot of confidence in to be the starter for the foreseeable future beyond this season? Yeah. I mean, he's 24 now. He's played a bunch of games, you know, as a pro, counting Cincinnati, counting Rochester. Um, he's physically better in the wake of his hip surgery a couple of years ago. Uh, his game is different. He's not flopping around. He's much calmer in the crease. I could see a UPL levi pattern here going and keep in mind pat the game has changed you're never going to have another ryan miller you're not right. going to have a guy who's going to play 65 games a year anymore that's really not done except for about how many guys are like that in the league now five or six you know most teams are going to go toward the boston model with swayman and allmark sharing the duties so what's wrong with going to a lucan and levi tandem where one guy plays 50 games and one guy plays 32. That's really where the league is trending right now anyway. So the Sabres are developing two really good prospects. That's what they want to do. And you're right. I mean, there's no question now heading into next year who the goaltender is here. It's number one. He's the guy. He's the starting goalie. It's just a question of does Levi make the team next year as the number two, which I think is what they, their plan is. Or do they bring in someone else for a year and keep Levi in Rochester again? But really, that like you say, the two outgrowths of this season, UPL is far and away number one. And number two is I do think the second half of the year, we've seen a tremendous step up from Rasmus Dahlin, who was not good enough for the first half of the year, who was, I think, feeling the weight of expectations, the weight of his contract starting next year. And I think we saw this two years ago as well. When Rasmus Dahlin goes to the All-Star game, it changes him. It changes him as a player. I think it changes him a little as a person. I think he gets a sense of belief again, reinvigoration to himself to understand how good he can be, and he comes back a different player. And I think the All-Star game has positively impacted him again for the second time in his career, and he has really taken off here in the second half of this season. That it, I think he needs to keep that momentum going, and I think those two things are your big takeaways from the positive side of this season. Uh, baseball season's getting ready to start. Cover the Bisons, some Blue Jays as well. Is it How nice is it when it gets to be this time of year, especially the grind <laughs> of the slog of another playoff list Sabres season to be able to get to the ballpark and the nicer weather and just baseball. I know you're a big baseball guy. People, you've been covering hockey forever. So people, I think most people would associate you with hockey for that reason. But I've been covering baseball, baseball far time. longer, actually. Yeah. I've been covering baseball far longer since yeah, 1993 yeah, yeah. with the Bisons. But yeah, yeah, this is actually a historic year, Pat. This is the first time the Bisons are going to play a game in March. The season opener is March 29th against Scranton Wilkesbury at Salem Field. Wow. And the major leagues start on the 28th, not counting the Dodger Padre games in Korea the week before. The majors start on the 28th. So, yeah, opening day in Buffalo, March 29th. That uh, could be a little dicey. And the thing I joke with people, people say, oh, they're opening in March 29th. Oh, by the way, it's a three-game series. So they're playing on March 30th and 31st as well. So, yeah, you could have weather like this week, though. Could be 65 degrees and sunny. We could have snow. Who knows? But yeah, I, I joked when the calendar hit March, we're four weeks away from opening day at Salem Field. And the funny part, too, is the Sabres have a game that night against the New Jersey Devils. I'll probably be at the Bisons game that day now that it looks like the Sabres are out of things. But the uh, hockey season will still be in full swing when the Bisons throw the first pitch on March 29th at 2.05.
How nice is it, though, just to get that change? You know what I mean? You cover hockey sure. for, for all these months to be able to go to the ballpark and, and start covering baseball as well. It's got to be a nice change up. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't mind the 12 month season going from one to the other. I get my time off. But yeah, baseball has a different feel, a different pace. You know, AAA baseball, especially, is a lot less intense than the major leagues, a lot less intense than the NHL. Um, there's a different pace and a different cadence to it. And like I say, I've been covering the Bison since the ballpark opened in 1988 and, you know, on a regular basis since 1993. So um, it's always nice to get back there and you see the sun and, you're outside, and yeah, it is definitely a little different than uh, the hockey arenas of North America. Even though you don't cover them professionally, how locked in do you stay with the Buffalo Bills? Like everything that's going on with the team, how closely do you follow the team, even if it's just from a personal oh, yeah. standpoint? You know, I follow it. You have to. You're in Buffalo. I mean, I talk to some of our people who cover it. Um, I used to cover it a little bit in the mid-2000s. We had some internet projects. So there was two seasons where I was out there most every home game. Um, it's tough. Covering the NFL is tough. There's a lot of national people there. When you have a guy like Josh Allen, there's a lot of attention from a lot of national outlets. Um, and, you know, and, and you look at it, there's frustration with the fan base there because the Sabres, you're just trying to make the playoffs. The Bills, people are like, hey, why aren't we a Super Bowl team? Jim Kelly went to the Super Bowl four times, and you look at it, it's tough. Josh Allen's been to one AFC championship game in his career. And you're really starting to think they're underachieving in the postseason, but they have that that block. You know, what do they do about beating Patrick Mahomes? They haven't figured it out even in the postseason when it really matters. So it's it's a fascinating dynamic to watch because they should be in it every year. They're gonna be, you know, but are they here? Here's my hockey analogy, Pat. I think the Bills could be like the Washington Capitals. When they had Alex Ovechkin, they were in it. For about 15 years in a row, and every year they were a playoff failure, like losing the first round, losing the second round. They got one. They got over the top in 2018. They had the year, the magic run. They win the Stanley Cup in Vegas. They haven't won a playoff series since, I think. Um, maybe the Bills someday get one. And there's a lot of people in this town who just always say, get me one before I die. I feel the same way. You know? I, I think my whole mindset as a fan would completely yeah. change if either the Buffalo Sabres or the Bills just won one championship. Me one. I right. think I would yeah. be. I think I would be able to accept the failures that would come after that for sure. Uh, you've been around here forever. Can you imagine what the city would be like if either the Bills <laughs> won the Super Bowl or the Sabres won a Stanley Cup? The Sabres win a Stanley Cup would be crazy because you're talking a parade in June in good weather. Mm -hmm. That would be insane. If the Bills win a Super Bowl. That would be insane, too. You just hope there's not a foot of snow on the day you're trying to throw a parade. Um, but, no, I can't imagine that. In a Super Bowl, we've lived the Super Bowl, Pat. We've lived oh, yeah. four of them. We have never lived a day, and I do this when I cover the Stanley Cup. Think about this. What's the day like, Pat? The Sabres are playing in the Stanley Cup final, and they have three wins, okay? And the game is tonight. They could oh. win the Stanley Cup tonight. They've never been there. They've been to the final twice, only had two wins. The Bills four times could win the Super Bowl today. We've lived that. The Sabres could win the Stanley Cup tonight. To me, that would be the most interesting day in the history of Buffalo sports. We've never lived it. We don't know what that feeling would be. And I can't even imagine how you'd survive that entire day until 8-10 when they drop the puck. <laughs> you know, it, well, you and I have lived Buffalo Bills Super Bowls. There's a lot of uh, fans out there that have not lived any Buffalo Super Bowls. One last point, too. My son is 21 years old, and only, and he's a, he's a football guy. But over the last maybe two, two or so years, he started watching more and more hockey. It started out because he would play the video game, the NHL video game, and it kind of got him interested. And right. now he actually watches the game. And it's tough because, again, the last couple of years, understandably so, but dead buildings, you know, just not that same vibe. And you covered the team. You go back to those mid 2000s, the jury Breer mm -hmm. years, and the electricity in that arena every night and the, the party in the plazas and, and stuff like that. <laughs> like forget about winning a championship. Honest to God, if this Sabres, you're talking about the puck drop and you're man, you are 100% right. But at this point, just being game one of the first round of the playoffs, that puck right. drop at 8-10, if the Sabres got three wins in the first round, I think would be absolutely 
bananas here in this town as well. It's just, uh, it's nuts, man. But all right, I'm I, I'm going to let you go here. I appreciate your time very much. I know you got to get to the arena. Again, we take this early Tuesday. So if something happens before this drops, <laughs> Tuesday night on the YouTube side, Wednesday morning on the podcast side, uh, you know why? Make sure you follow Mike on Twitter at M here or at by M Harrington. And of course, check out the Buffalo News, man. Him and Lance, you guys really do crush it. I'm not just saying it because you're on the show. I, I say it all the time. I, I really do, man. You, you, Lance, you cover this team exceptionally well. Appreciate I appreciate it. that, Pat. It is, you know, it's something we do. We have a lot of passion for it. You know, you, you're, you're blessed that the management believes in it because we travel, and that's not the case in most markets now. A lot of places don't travel fully. So it's, you know, it's something we do and uh, we'll just keep following it day by day and maybe someday we'll cover a playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, last time I had Mike on too, we we hooked up at Amherst Ale House and had some really good wings. This time we did this remote. Next time I hook up with you, I'll make sure it's at a wing spot and we'll, <laughs> we'll catch some wings and, and some beer. But anyway, thank All you right, again, buddy. Mike. Thank you, Thanks. Mike Harrington. And I will be back with a brand new show tomorrow. I'll talk to you guys in.